Hello YouTubers, today we're going to talk about a new pattern in this series of talking about software development patterns. Uh, today we're going to talk specifically about the chain of responsibility pattern. Think about it when you're in a software development team, every person on the team is doing a different task to achieve the same goal, which is deliver a requirement. So some people are doing the requirements gathering, some people are doing the design, some people are doing front end, back end, dev DevOps, quality assurance, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but some of these responsibilities uh, are very, uh, they have to go in order. They're very sequential, right? Uh, one of them can't start until the other is done, right? So think about it from that perspective. You're getting a requirement. Christine here is a program manager. She's getting a requirement. She's breaking that down in your Agile board into a bunch of user stories. Your architect is picking those up and designing them into uh, architecture and components that software engineers will take on to develop. Software engineers can't start without the design. The design is done, software engineers starting to write some code. And then the quality assurance engineer can't test something that isn't developed yet. So they have to wait on the software engineers and so on and so forth with the, dev, uh, with the DevOps, right? How do we visualize and model that? We want to model that in, in a real world uh, software. We're going to write a program that shows us how that how would that look like, right? So if you look at here from at a glance, you can see that each and every one of those shares kind of two functionalities, right? The first functionality is the handling of the requirement. The second functionality is handing it over to the next person who is waiting on it to pick up on that requirement right so we need these two functions so as you thought you know we're gonna build an interface that dictates that both of these functions have to be there right both of these functions they must be there so how do we go do about that let's go write some software uh, let's go build that interface first and let's call our interface i handler an i handler will have a couple of methods the first method is to handle the requirement. We're going to build a, a, here a model. We're going to generate a quick model here that's called the requirement. We're going to do some stuff with it. So you're getting a requirement. You know, we want to build a website or whatever. The other one is a hand, uh, hand over, hand requirement over. And then hand, handing the requirement over, you're gonna want to handle it, hand it over to someone who also implements iHandler, right? So you want to hand that over after the requirement is done, you know, to the next person, right? Um, so okay, so we have these two things, and then uh, let's go ahead and fix our requirement. Our requirement here, just to keep track of things, I'm gonna build a quick list in here then I'm gonna call it operations so we can keep track of the operations that has been done operations done so when the operation is done you know the person will go ahead and you know uh, you know add that as an operation right we also need a constructor in here so the thing doesn't blow up we're gonna go and say operations done just instantiated with an empty list as soon as you get the requirement all right we have the requirement and we have the main idea right so we have I handler uh, for the time of this video, I already built something like that. I think I guess I called it handover when done. So let's just change that real quick. Call it handover when done. There you go. And now everything is satisfied. So what did I do here? You know, let me. What I, what I did here is that for the handle function, I added the operation with the name of the person that's handling this function, right? And then I handed that over to the next handler that'll take care of that requirement, right? So I know the architect knows they're gonna need to talk to a software engineer after they're done. So once their work is done, they're gonna hand that over to that person. The tricky part here is from a customer perspective, the customer doesn't see anybody except for Christine, right? So Christine will be the one, the triggerer of all of that. She'll be the one that when she starts handling, the, 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 the customer doesn't have to go to Todd and say handle and go to Janet and say handle, say to Alex say handle. It doesn't have to go to all these people. They just have to talk to Christine. So by saying Christine handle that requirement, that means every single, re in, every single uh, 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 action that's going to follow that should be triggered by the original handling from Christine's side, right? 
So how does that work? Let's go to the program in here and let's build that. Let's build a requirement. Requirement. Right? And then let's build the team. So I'm starting with Christine, she's a program manager. There you go. And then let's start with Todd, the architect. And then let me put in here the rest of the team real quick. So for the time of this video, so here's the rest of the team. So we're recruiting the team. Here's the rest of the team for you. So we're building those folk. And then we're telling, we're educating these folks who to talk to. So introduce the team to each other. So what I'm going to go here and say, Christine, please, when you're done, hand it over to Todd. And Todd will hand over to Janet, the software engineer, and Janet will hand over to um, to Alex, and Alex will hand over to Mike, which is the DevOps engineer. Something tricky here for you to, to notice. Um, Mike doesn't need to hand over to anybody. So if you go to the DevOps engineer, what I basically did in here, there is no handling, he's not calling anybody else. And there is handover when done is not done. It's just not implemented because there is no handing over to anybody, right? If anything, it'll just go back to, to Janet and then or the client, right? All right, let's see if that actually works. So we, what I'm going to do here, test. Let's test that. So for each var operation in the requirement that operations done, let's print out the ideal world here is that uh, each and every one of those should leave their mark on the requirement. So I'm printing out the operation. You know, and let's say the operation is done. So this operation that we're printing, done. If I run this right now, nothing happens. Why nothing happens? Because nobody talked to Christine yet, right? Nothing has triggered. We need to go talk to the one person that the client can see, right? So let's go here and say, meet the client. Program manager. Client and program manager got together and they handed over the requirement. So Christine will, will say, handle the requirement. That's the only thing in here that will trigger all these operations for the rest of the team. Now things have changed. If I run my program now, what we expect is that all these operations are done. So the program manager got it done, architect got it done, hand over to the engineer, quality assurance, and then DevOps. So you see how this chain of responsibility work? You build a, a bunch of classes that have to um, uh, adhere to certain rules based on the, the interface, and then you make sure each and every one of those is doing the handling and the handing over, right? Um, now, um, from an academic standpoint, there is there is different terms that people may use when they're speaking about this pattern from an abstract standpoint, right? Uh, I want you to visualize the pattern, understand what things do, rather than memorizing some terms, right? So whether they call this, you know, set successor or you know, uh, attach successor or whatever the handling they would call it. That doesn't matter. You have the pattern. You understand how it works, and then you could use that. There are some drawbacks for this pattern uh, while we're talking about it. Uh, it's very stateful. Like, for instance, what if the architect failed to finish the design? Now everything crumbles, right? Now you need to do to have some mechanism to roll back the stuff that happened to that requirement up until this point. We need to roll back all the work so you don't have some bad data stuck in your database about some requirement that was never done. Um, you may think about the memento pattern that I talked to you about before. In the real, real world, it's very unlikely to find a pattern like this. You'll come across a software uh, that does implement that pattern. But in, in today's world, people think about each and every one of those as its own microservice or Lambda. And when the microservice is done, it goes and calls the broker class and it goes, goes and calls the next microservice and the next microservice. It's very stateless, right? 
but it is also good to know about that pattern and there are uses for that pattern like I said you're not going to start your project with a microservices architecture you should start monolithic and then when needed break it down into microservices so until then if you need to use that pattern to segregate and separate the responsibility between each and every class based on the business logic that it's working on definitely the chain of resp responsibility is something you want to look at it all depends on what fulfills your requirement and how much stateful or stateless you want to be if you have any questions comments you think I went off rails or said something that is not exactly of that pattern please feel free to leave a comment question uh, voice or concern and please don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you in another video thank you for watching